Hello everybody, Samuel Andreev here to answer viewers' questions about music and composition and anything else. So, um, I've got some good ones here. I'll just point out that I'm currently traveling. I'm in London at the moment and I don't have my good camera with me, so the quality won't be as good as usual. But with that proviso, let's launch into the questions. So Barney writes, do you believe a deep background and understanding of music composition and theory is a requirement for creating a musical masterpiece? No. Partly because there are no requirements for creating a musical masterpiece to the extent that such a thing could even be defined in the first place. Like, what exactly do you mean by a musical masterpiece? Um, but I would say that, generally speaking, if you're a student, if you're sort of starting out as a composer, you might as well start out with the assumption that having a very thorough knowledge of music history and of uh, some great works of, uh, of Western music and beyond would be an asset. I think that would be a safe assumption to make. Uh, you could also assume that knowing some traditional techniques would be useful as well. So knowing how to write uh, harmony and counterpoint and all of this sort of thing, and being able to analyze classical scores. Uh, you should assume that those skills would be useful because in all likelihood they will be. Now that's not to say that occasionally, you know, on, on in very rare instances, sometimes you do have an artist who is really singular uh, and who, for one reason or another, has you know, a very unusual background or maybe does not engage all that deeply with the classical tradition and still manages to do things that are compelling. Yes, that occasionally does happen, but it's very rare. And in most cases, it's, uh, it's advisable to try to find out as much as you possibly can about the field that you are uh, endeavoring to presumably spend a good deal of your life engaging with. So that would be the assumption that I would make. And, you know, even if you don't en end up necessarily being a composer, uh, having a good knowledge of music history is something that is just incredibly valuable to have anyway, because it touches upon so many different things. Ferwi Hamza writes, a lot of people say that music theory kills creativity. While I don't agree 100% with this statement, it's certainly true in a lot of cases. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, okay, so what is music theory? Well, if you boil it down, music theory is knowledge. That's what it is. It's knowledge about um, how certain musical languages function. Um, knowledge does not kill anything. Like, n knowledge does not kill creativity, unless there's something seriously wrong with the knowledge. Um, Ignorance will limit your options. So uh, I have to qualify this somewhat by saying that there is a difference between the way uh, music is learned in popular idioms and the way it's learned in traditions that are primarily written via scores, for example, via the written document. There is a difference in those traditions. There are all kinds of oral musical cultures in which uh, traditions and styles are, are handed down directly without the intermediary of any kind of a written text. However, the Western classical tradition, if you want to call it that, uh, primarily has been transmitted by means of written documents. And if you want to understand how those things work, how notation works, how they put together and how the language functions, then you're going to have to grapple with, with what is called music theory. I have to also qualify that by saying that I'm, I don't consider myself at all to be a theorist, and I'm certainly not a musicologist, I'm not really a scholar, I'm just a composer. But one thing that I would say is, is worth bearing in mind with regards to theory is that, generally speaking, theorists come after the composers have done their work. So most composers in music history, certainly not all, but but most of them are not primarily theorists. They are, they are creative artists and they're producing work that responds to the needs of their time and responds to a particular uh, stylistic niche that they're filling. And so the, the theory has to come from practice. And very often what you see is that theorists will come in afterwards, after the, long after the composer has died, and then they'll try to make sense of what's been done and try to interpret it and try to see if there's any kind of uh, consistency to it in terms of how it, how it functions. So a lot of the music theory that is taught now is music theory that really came after the fact to some extent. So that's also worth bearing in mind, but that doesn't make it necessarily any less valuable as knowledge, especially if you want to understand the way the, uh, the repertoire functions and has been put together. So Magic Wheel 1 writes, what is your advice for an isolated self-taught composer on getting his first piece performed? How would you go about that? 
the first thing you need to do is to stop being isolated. And that might sound like a facetious comment, but it really isn't. The truth is, is that the music world is made up of people who, uh, who need to help each other and who need to support each other in order for the work to exist. You cannot do it alone. Like, nobody can succeed at music alone. Um, so how do you go about doing that exactly? Well, I don't know, obviously, the circumstances of your life, but I mean, usually uh, in, in your community, no matter how small, no matter how isolated it may be, unless you're living like in Franz Joseph land or like Svalbard or one of those types of places, but I mean, I would be surprised. Um, probably there is a musician or there is somebody, you know, within traveling distance who knows something about music or plays an instrument. You, you just have to go and seek these people out and try to form some kind of a community around you. And if that's really difficult or impossible or, or impractical due to your living circumstances, then you can also try doing that via the internet. And obviously that doesn't replace it, but uh, it's, it's a lot better than nothing. And so you can, you can start by, you know, by trying to join message boards, trying to uh, join some kind of an online community. And, and that can actually also point you towards, uh, towards people that you might not have known about in your community. So that would be my advice. I would say it's, it's really impossible uh, to, to get pieces played and to, uh, to get anything happening in music without the support of other people. And you do have to be a little bit lucky with that, but it's also something that you can cultivate and that you can work on. And you just have to, you have to put the effort into that. And it's not always easy. And, you know, it's not even because you're living in a large city that it's easy either, because some people are uh, sort of introverted by nature or it's very difficult for them to meet people. Uh, but no matter what your circumstances are, I would say make the effort, find out if there are any musicians in your community, see if you can contact them and then go from there. And also, you know, use the internet because it's an amazing tool. So Stephen M. Pollied writes, I'm from a small country in Europe and I would like to be in contact with contemporary music, but there is very little space for that music around here. So I was wondering if there are any places online where one can get to know works by new composers. Thanks. Well, thank you for your question. I wonder how small the country is that you're from. Like, are we talking like San Marino, um, Vatican City? The, the question of a small country is really a relative thing, especially in Europe. I'm, I'm always curious about that. Anyway, um, okay, so what I would say about that is uh, what, you, what you can do is you, you, you can subscribe to channels of contemporary music ensembles because that's actually a very good way generally of finding out what's happening and just getting a kind of uh, broad view of some of the things that are happening in, in contemporary music. So, for example, there's a group that I work with a lot called Ensemble Proton of of the Swiss city, Bern, and they have a wonderful YouTube channel and they video most of their concerts and they put the, the pieces up on, on their YouTube channel so you can watch them perform these new pieces, many of which were written for them. So what I would say is check out the channels of, uh, of contemporary music groups that you like. Uh, lots of them have their own YouTube channels. Uh, Ensemble Contrechamp also has one in Switzerland. There's the Ensemble Intercontemporain in Paris that has its own YouTube channel. Um, there, there are many others, uh, London Sinfonietta, just any group that you know of or that you like or that you've experienced through recordings, check out if they have a channel, subscribe to it and watch their videos and you'll get, uh, you'll get an overview of what's happening, maybe not internationally, but at least in the country that that group is based in. So one, two, three, okay, Paul, four, five, six, I love these handles, writes, I came across this quote from German composer Paul Hindemith. Music, as long as it exists, will always take its departure from the major triad and return to it. The musician cannot escape it any more than the painter, his primary colors, or the architect, his three dimensions. As a contemporary composer, what do you think of this quote? Does Hindemith have a point, or is he being too conservative here? That quote, actually, I'm familiar with. It, it comes from uh, Paul Hindemith's book on the craft of musical composition. And there's a couple of things that you might want to say about that, just, just to give a bit of context. So one of them is that Hindemith was actually obsessed with the idea of finding some kind of a natural law to govern music. And part of the reason he was obsessed with this, I think, was that he was working in sort of in the, in the late 1920s, early 1930s at that point um, on um, the development of a new musical language that would be completely chromatic, sort of in the same sense that Schoenberg's had been, but without venturing into complete atonality. He wanted there to be some kind of a, a pole or some kind of a, a sense of uh, 
of, of tonal attraction or at least of relative consonants and dissonance that would still operate in his music. So he needed to base that idea of his upon some kind of a theory. So his idea was that you could have a, a sort of a spectrum with, on one end of the spectrum, simple consonant sonorities such as a major triad, and on the other end of the spectrum you could have really super dissonant complicated chromatic chords and you could sort of move between one and the other in your composition but that this sort of idea would only make sense if you had the common triad to refer to so that there was a spectrum of, of relative simplicity and consonants and and relative complexity and, and dissonance and chromaticism on the other that idea is really quite particular to Hindemith, I would say. I don't think it applies to every musician necessarily. And, you know, there, there is all kinds of music that isn't really triadic in nature and that functions perfectly well. So the other thing is that, that, that I would say about that is that, like, yes, it's true that the triad is, is derived from the harmonic series, but you could derive other things from the harmonic series as well. If you were to take the harmonic series as just kind of a, an indifferent object and say, okay, I'm going to use this as, as a kind of a found object that exists in nature and base my musical language upon that, then you would have to account for the fact that the seventh partial is extremely low and so on. And there's, there's all these weird microtonal tunings within the, 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 uh, the overtone series. And you would have to decide, do I want to work with these sort of, uh, these sort of uh, very crazy microtonal uh, complicated tunings, or do I want to you know, create some kind of a scale that is a little bit more equal, more, more sort of easy to, to manage. And that's actually what happened in Western music. It's like the, 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 the system of temperament that we use is, uh, is, a, is a compromise, and it's, it's the farthest thing from a natural scale that you could possibly imagine. So there's a, there's a few things to bear in mind as far as that goes. Uh, the other thing I would add to that is that there, there's a lot of sort of facile commenting in the new music world about sort of uh, uh, neo-romanticism and neoclassicism and, and, and using and pieces that are tonal as opposed to atonal and so on. Very often these terms are thrown about without people really reflecting too much on what they mean. So for example, if you were to say, uh, you know, I'm going to write a piece of tonal music, you have to actually think very carefully about what tonality actually is. And I would say that you need to have some sort of notion of, of a hierarchy and of goal-directed motion in the harmony. And if you don't have that, if you're simply using consonant sounds like triads and perfect fifths and so on, that's not enough to constitute tonality. And the proof of that, I would say, is you can listen to the work of American minimalists like uh, Steve Reich, for example, who use triads all the time in their music, but I would really hesitate to call it tonal. I don't think it's tonal at all, actually. Uh, so there's a difference between music that uses consonant sonorities and music that is actually tonal in the, in the classical sense. I also have a video about that, which is called uh, Atonality Explained in 10 Minutes, if you're interested in knowing more about that. So... Coin Toaster writes, what does it mean to understand a piece? Is it possible to disassemble a piece perfectly, technically, yet completely ignore the mood and miss the point of the whole thing? So there's a wonderful quote from the American composer Morton Feldman that I'm going to bring up because it really illustrates this point, I think, quite well. He was fond of sort of uh, uh, making fun of some of his, uh, his more academic colleagues by saying that, you know, composers who come up with these elaborate systems and theories for pieces, and then and then write the piece according to the system or the theory. It's like a doctor who comes out of the operating room and says, well, the operation was a complete success, but the patient has died. It's like, you do everything, you know, according to the theory, uh, completely correctly, according to whatever uh, sort of pre-compositional idea you have of the piece. And then maybe the piece just doesn't work at all as music. Like it's, it's, so that's, that's something to, to bear in mind. I would say that, yes, it's, of course it's possible to, to completely miss the point of a piece. Uh, like it, that happens all the time. It happens all the time in musicology. It happens all the time in, uh, with, with music theorists. Part of the problem is that very often uh, musicologists will start by trying to develop some kind of an overarching theory to explain this or that musical phenomenon. And then they try to sort of shoehorn the pieces into the theory, and it's like it's it's completely it's a completely backwards way to look at things. Like one one example that that I think is particularly uh, egregious would be the book uh, the atonal music of of Anton Webern by Alan Forte. So Alan Forte is, was a was a very highly respected American musicologist who, among other things, developed the the pitch class idea and just the idea of of, of pitch class analysis of of atonal music. So the problem with this book, though, is that it um, it looks at Webern's music from an almost exclusively pitch aspect, like it, it ignores everything else. It ignores uh, rhythm, it ignores 
uh, duration, it ignores timbre, it ignores gesture, it ignores the, the, the expressive context even of these pieces, and it just tries to understand them from this, this one vantage point of, of this sort of atonal set class theory, which uh, was something that obviously Webern had never even heard of because uh, it, was a, it was a term that was invented by this musicologist. Um, and I think it actually has almost no bearing whatsoever on how Webern actually worked and how his pieces function and how you hear them, like in terms of your actual perception. So um, it's, it's just an example of, of, a, of a theory being invented to try to account for a musical phenomenon, but doing so in an extremely narrow-minded way, I think that, that does absolutely uh, nothing to further our comprehension of the, of the work in question. So Jonas Omland writes, I'm very interested in composing and I would like to be able to call myself a composer someday. Unfortunately, I don't have access to any formal education about the matter and my knowledge of composing as a craft is cripplingly limited. I know some technical stuff like form, structure, and instrumental facts, etc. But I struggle when it comes to actually crafting and forming a piece of music out of the ideas I hear in my head. How can a person in my situation get into composing and start writing their first piece? I would say that if, if you had to wait until your sort of technical knowledge and understanding of music were perfect before you started writing a piece, you probably wouldn't get very far as a composer. So you, you need to allow yourself the leeway to write pieces that you don't really know how to write and to make mistakes and, uh, and to write really bad, clumsy pieces. Like, everybody has to do that. I, I did it. You know, all the students I know um, have to do it. There's really no getting away from it. Like you're not going to write masterpieces straight off. So, however, you can you can make the process more uh, efficient if you want to use that word, and less painful by setting up exercises for yourself. And probably I wouldn't even think of them as exercises, but let's say compositional projects for yourself that have very specific limitations built in. So that might mean, for example, instead of having a project to just write a piece. Uh, for, let's say, I don't know, wind quintet, for example, it, it might be way too vague a project for you to actually be, be useful. If you were to instead say, okay, I'm going to write a series of 30-second etudes for wind quintet, each of which is going to deal with this very specific musical problem of some kind, and I'm going to write five of them, then, then you have a specific project and it's much, much more easily graspable, and it's far easier to actually make progress if you're working that way. So I would say um, write pieces that are with, within your grasp to write, but that present specific technical challenges. So that might mean, for example, imagine that you were to write a series of piano etudes. And I do this with students, by the way, and it's, it's, I've often found it to be incredibly helpful. You might set yourself some kind of an arbitrary constraint. You could say, okay, the piano piece that I'm going to write has to be no more than one minute long. Uh, it has to consist of only a single melodic line. No chords, no second voice, nothing, just one melodic line. Or you could say, um, you're going to write a cello piece that only uses five notes, and, that, and you have to somehow make a piece out of that, and it has to last for 45 seconds. I would say start with things like that, and you would be surprised, actually, um, how, how much it's possible to do, even with very restricted means. So uh, this is a mistake that, that students and beginner composers make all the time. They start out with these projects that are way too complex. It's like you're trying to solve 50 problems at once in this piece, and that's just not going to work. You have to make it really, really specific. And as you gain more experience also as a composer, you find that you're, you're always doing this instinctively anyway. Like you're always having to um, parse the project into manageable chunks. Otherwise, it's like if you were to just sit down to write, you know, without having anything more specific than that, you would probably be paralyzed. Like you need a project, you need to have a duration, you need to have an instrumentation, you need to have something specific that you're trying to do in the piece. So I would say uh, be really draconian about that, like really uh, uh, narrow it down as much as you can and write really, really sharply focused short pieces. So Julius Seizure writes, what is your opinion on the music of so-called outsider musicians such as Jandek, the Shags, etc.? Does it feel like you are intruding and or participating in some form of exploitation, especially when the artist has suffered from mental illness? Look, the, the, the difficult thing about this question, actually, is that if you were to sort through music history and have two categories of musicians, okay, and on the one side you would have musicians who had some kind of a pathology or who were kind of not, not completely normal in some way or another, and on the other you had sort of like normal, regular people, 
all the composers would be in this category of people who have some kind of a weird pathology, like almost all of them. I don't know who would be left. I really don't. So that's the sort of initial problem is like a lot of the, uh, the great musicians throughout history and indeed today, like to varying degrees, there's something a little bit weird about them. And I mean, that's just, it's part and parcel, I would say, of being a creative person. Um, the, where it gets tricky, though, is, is, is sort of separating out, and, and that's not to say that everyone obviously has some kind of like a real, a real mental illness or a pathology, because that's not the claim I'm making. But uh, the point is, um, if, if you were to try to separate out the creativity from the pathology, I think there's, there's one thing that you would discover, and it's, it's the case with musicians who have had uh, real struggles with, with, with mental illness. So, uh, Robert Schumann, for example, is, 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 uh, is one that comes immediately to mind. So when he was really sick, like when, we, when he was really having a hard time, he wasn't productive. Um, and in fact, uh, there were a series of pieces that he wrote towards the end of his life when he was really not well at all that his wife decided to destroy because she felt that it wouldn't reflect well on his talent. So like the, the great pieces that he wrote were written during periods of relative lucidity and clarity and, uh, and periods of relative, um, uh, just, just like high functioning basically. Uh, and it's the case with other musicians too. So Nathan Gale writes, in your conversations with Julian Anderson and Paul Steenhusen, you've talked about how you can spend hours or days working out very short musical phrases say, a few bars that might last a couple of seconds. Their response seems to indicate that this is a fairly common experience with contemporary composers. Why do you find it worthwhile to spend so much time crafting something that is so short that many people may not notice or remember? Do you think belonging to a certain school of composing would alleviate this situation as the basics of the musical language in those traditions have already been pretty well worked out? Okay, so that's, that's a question with a few components to it. So. The question as to why I would spend so long making something that is so short, that actually comes up with some regularity. Like people often ask, like, why would you spend 18 months on a piece that might be 15 minutes long or 20 minutes long or whatever it might be? Um, so the first thing I would say is that there are periods where you're facing some kind of a, an exceptionally difficult technical challenge of some kind or an expressive challenge, or you've got something that you want to write, but you don't know how to do it or you've got a bunch of different intuitions and you're not quite sure how they fit together or how, how you can make a piece out of that. And sometimes it just takes a really long time. Like that's, that's just the mysterious nature of the, of the creative process. And there are extreme examples of that. Like the, the, the composer George Benjamin is certainly uh, an example. So his piece, Sudden Time for Orchestra, took him, I think, over 10 years to reach its final form. And he was really working hard on that piece. And uh, there are e enormous amounts of sketches for it. Uh, Elliot Carter, throughout the 1960s, I think he wrote two or three pieces in that decade. I mean, they're all extraordinary singular pieces. But uh, again, they required literally thousands of pages of sketches uh, to, uh, to put together. So there are instances in a, in a composer's life where they're just working through a lot of things they don't know how to do yet. Uh, they're trying to develop some new techniques. They're trying to develop a new approach. And it, it's not so much that they're having trouble with a specific piece. It's that they're, they're dealing with all of these different things at the same time. But very often what happens is once that incredibly slow, painful, torturous process of working all of these things out is over, then they can often work with a little bit more freedom. And that's certainly what happened with Elliot Carter. You can see in his, in his last couple of decades, particularly, there was this outpouring of work after work after work. It's just with absolutely phenomenal uh, intensity, especially given that this is somebody who lived to be, the, to be 103 years old and was productive right up to the very end. I mean, that's, that's a remarkable uh, story in the, in the history of music. And George Benjamin also has been incredibly productive. He's written several operas, one after the other. Absolutely amazing works, too, I would, I would add. So sometimes that's just how it is. You need to you need to work through some some difficult uh, periods in your creative history in order to get to uh, get to the next stage. So here's the last one I'm going to do. So Juan Pedro Souza writes, "Hello Samuel, what is your opinion on adamant avant-garde thinking?" I'm talking about people like Boulez or some Latin American composers who are staunch and almost dog dogmatic about aesthetics, ethics, and the matter of progress and reaction. I'd like to know your position. Thank you. I don't like dogmatism. I don't like ideologies of any kind, and I certainly don't like them in art. So that would be my answer to that. I would qualify that somewhat by saying that there are moments in music history, there are, there are moments in the lives of individual creators where for one reason or another, it seems to be necessary for them to exaggerate a great deal. In other words, to 
go farther than you might think it, it would appear to be necessary to go in a particular direction. And there might be all kinds of reasons for that. So one of them might be professional pressure. It might be that there is a kind of a resistance to their ideas. And so they, they sort of feel like they need to exaggerate to really get their point across. Um, there might be also instances where a composer is just having a hard time having their voice be heard for one reason or another. Uh, maybe the field is really crowded. Maybe uh, there isn't a great deal of uh, sympathy necessarily for whatever direction they're trying to go in. And they just, by reaction or through bloody mindedness or through a desire to make, uh, you know, to to make some noise in their music community, they do something that is really, really so exaggerated and so spectacular that you can't not pay attention to it. So that does happen. And I find that, you know, you can't really criticize that exactly. It's like if someone's sort of reacting very strongly to their milieu, obviously, in a like either in a positive or a negative way and producing work that is somewhat exaggerated for that reason then that's just something that they have to work through and maybe it's necessary for them. And very often, you know, once that initial period of really intense uh, exaggeration or like really just going as far as possible in a certain direction, once that process has played itself out, there's, there's very often a kind of a, a slight movement back to the middle again. And then they'll take what they've learned out in the badlands, so to speak, and bring it back into a more, a somewhat more conventional sphere. And that will add to the richness of their, of their future production. That does happen all the time. So um, I would say, you know, I have, I have no problem with really uh, intense and exaggerated styles whatsoever. On the contrary, they can be very stimulating and uh, and musically very interesting and compelling. Um, but when it becomes a matter of dogmatism, like it's a very different matter. Like it's one thing for a composer to say, like this is what I need to be doing right now, or this is where my uh, compositional work is taking me. That's one thing. But when artists start saying everybody else should be doing it too, um, that's not good. That's not good at all, and I don't like people who who come out and and sort of pontificate or moralize about what other what other musicians should be doing, because there are all kinds of different types of creators out there. There are all type, all types of different uh, contexts, also for music, and you have to accept that uh, it's you know it's a, it's a huge ocean. Music is a huge ocean with all kinds of possibilities, and uh, it's not going to just go in in any one direction. That's obvious, and. I would think that particularly today in, in 2019, it would be next to impossible to to imply that somehow the, the world of music generally, like the world of, of composition, would need to go in this or that direction because it's just way too diffuse and varied and, and diverse for that ever to happen, I would say at this point. There are tendencies, there are schools, there are particular composers that are very influential and that have a lot of epigons, they have a lot of followers. That's one thing. but but you can't really say that the entire music world is going in, in this or that direction or that it should go in this or that direction. And I would be very, very suspicious of anyone who came out making that claim. Thank you for these incredibly interesting and stimulating and intelligent questions. I wish I had time to answer more of them. I got many, many more than the ones that I answered, but hopefully that's a good start. And uh, I'll see you soon with my next video. If you like this channel, support it. Your help allows me to keep on making high quality music education videos available to anyone around the world who wants to watch them at any time for free. Check out the rewards for varying levels of support at www.patreon.com/samuelandreev. Thanks for watching.